So we're supposed to start the podcast. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, that wasn't great. One, two, three. Better. All right. Welcome to Asshole Island. Pumps, what have you had it with? What I've had it with is all of these governments banning abortion, getting into women's health care, specifically the recent Supreme Court that intervened after a judge allowed a woman that was 20 weeks pregnant that was going to have a baby that was non-viable, going to lose her chance for fertility, and they refused to allow the court's order. Therefore, she had to go out of state to get an abortion. It just makes me so fucking mad. You're talking about the Supreme Court of the state of Texas. Correct. And um, I followed this story. It's horrible. And it's jaw-dropping. It's jaw-dropping because I cannot for the life of me understand how small government allows the Texas Supreme Court to decide a woman's fertility and family future. I'll tell you why. Because they only want small government as it pertains to business and regulations of profit. Beyond that, they want a very large, robust government when it comes to legislating social issues. Right. And what they deem um, their moral purpose in life, which is to somehow, I guess, they believe that if you legislate this morality, that it is going to change the sexual practices of its citizens. Right. Like abstinence. That's been such a great vehicle for keeping unwanted pregnancies around. Yeah. I think, you know, these uh, abstinence only politicians, the mothers, you can think of Sarah Palin. I think her kids got knocked up out of wedlock. Lauren Boebert. Yeah. She's like 35 and a grandma. And then her. Yeah. I mean, it's just the hypocrisy just goes all through me. But in this particular situation, I mean, all situations are dire. Abortion is never an easy decision. But for, to have to go to court to have a health procedure, to have that health procedure awarded, and then the Supreme Court to then say, no, you can't have it. It just, I mean, it like kept me up one night. I was so upset about it. This is the one that we know about. There's one every single day across the right. country this, in these red states. This lady was brave enough. Absolutely. To put her face out there. And when she's going through something incredibly painful, the anguish she must have felt, and she was brave enough to put her face out there on behalf of all women who have a constitutional right to privacy. Right. And that is being denied to them so that a bunch of old white dudes can feel good about all of their extracurricular activities they do regarding sex. Right. Because here's my thing. If they want to control the uterus of women, then I want to be petty and I want to control when you're beating off, exactly what type of porn are you watching and where is the semen going? Is it going in a tissue? Are you throwing it down the drain? I mean, where's it going? Because that's where we need to start. They want to tit, let's tat. Absolutely. I want... I think about that all the time. If we think were about sperm all the time, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, no, I do not. But I think about if we were trying to legislate the health of a scrotum or a penis in the government, that would never fly. We would never be able to do it. Uh -uh. But yet, a female's body is just hunky dory. Let's sit around and talk about it. Let's talk about her healthcare choices. We want everybody involved. It's just simply not the government's business at all, full stop. Ever. No. And they're not able, they're not equipped with the knowledge that a physician is or a hospital. These are people that went to law school, most generally. I don't know anything about it. Not anything. in our state. I think we have, uh, you know, that uh, Mark Wayne Mullen, the senator. You know, who stands on the booster box. Right, the booster chair boy. Who got in a fight with the a, Teamsters guy. Yeah, yeah, and Bernie Sanders had to scold him. <laughs> that was we'll so call funny. him Booster Box Mullins. Booster Box. Booster Box Mullins isn't hardly even educated. He's a plumber. Right. So this is just, and, and then he's the type of guy that takes a family photo with a bunch of AR-15s. Absolutely. I've seen it. And is just, it's like this 
it's such insanity the things that these politicians cling on to as their moral calling. Right. I mean, women in this country have less rights than guns in this country. That's true. And they could give a fuck. They could give a fuck. Once that baby is born. It's just, it's infuriating. I've fucking had it. I have fucking had it. And they're all lying liars. Lying liars. Yeah. Yeah. And complete hypocrites, especially Booster Box Mullins. Booster Box wants to get in a fist fight because he's so cool. Booster Box with his AR-15. <laughs> But let's just visit. Why would you have a big giant gun and a big boy step to step on pumps? Why? Because you have a little teeny weenie. You have a teeny weenie. Booster Box Mullins and his teeny weenie. And his has big gun. His big gun and his big boy step. <laughs> he gets on his big boy step as he picks a fight with the Teamsters. And Grandpa Bernie scolds him and he sits back down. <laughs> Fucking douche. Total douche. Okay, let me tell you what I've had it with. Okay. I've had it with your... You're, you're deciding that you're going to be intellectually curious. So you turn to the World Wide Web and you're Googling something that you would like to gather some information on. And you see the headline for an article and you're like, this is the exact thing right. that I'm searching for. And you click on it and it's a fucking slideshow article. Oh, I hate those. You're, and I'm like, I want it all on one page. Right. What? I don't want it on one page. I don't want advertisements in between. It's a complete bait and switch. It's a bait and switch. They get you on there and then you're in and then you go about two or three slides in and then there's some snake oils ad, ad yep. for some racket that you don't need and then you accidentally click it and then it, all these pop-ups right. come up and I'm just like, I'm trying to be an intellectually curious person in my private time right now to find an article to read about. Maybe it's something petty. Maybe it's something serious. Nonetheless, enough with the slideshows. No, they're the worst. Enough. I don't want a PowerPoint presentation on the fucking internet. Do journalism. Stop with all the clickbait nonsense. I've had it. I've had it with that. No, I do that all the time and it makes me crazy. It's like maybe it's a list, a list of something. Right. These are the, you know, top countries to visit. You're like, oh, what are they? And then it's one. Or these are the most fucked up states in America. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I wonder, is Where Oklahoma, Oklahoma is? top two or three <laughs> this year? So you click on it and then you start clicking through. And it's just, it's such nonsense. It drives me bananas. Yeah, I hate it. I hate those ads that pop up because then it completely derails your search. Yes. All right. I want to welcome everybody to I've Had It Podcast. I'm Jennifer. I'm Angie. She's the star of the show, the mayor of Asshole Island, <laughs> our Lord and personal savior, Judge Judy <laughs> Diana. Before we kick it to Kylie, I think it's time to um, go over our disappointing affirmations of the day. Okay, good. Because I, love these. I hate toxic positivity. It puts me in a bad mood. Right. I really like cynical I do too. Inspiration. All right. So from our friends with the Instagram account, Disappointing Affirmations, let's commence our dramatic reading of the day. Disappointing Affirmations. Do you want another one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Stop wondering if you're good enough. You're not. <laughs> Today, I'm taking control of my emotions. I'm choosing to feel dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a really good one because sometimes you do want to feel dead. You just want to be mad. You want to be sad. You want to feel dead. Yeah. You want to maybe, you know, why does everybody else get to be crazy for a day? I want to be fucking crazy and dead for a day. Yeah. Love okay. That. The next one. You're doing the best you can, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I feel like that so many times. <laughs> I've actually been in conversations with people before, and they're telling me how they handled something, which was not the best way to handle it at all. And then they'll follow up with, but I just did the best I can. And I've said to myself in my brain, God, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> I don't say that out loud. Thank goodness you didn't say it out loud. I don't. But in my head, I'm thinking, really? That's the best you could have done? And the best one of the day. You are filled with so much potential. What a fucking waste. <laughs> <laughs> I love those. Kylie. Okay, I have a five-star review that I want to read you from Naysauce525. 
titled My Favorite Queer Podcast. <laughs> you two are my very favorite, in quotes, straight white women. <laughs> However, we spend so much time talking about how Pumps is a lesbian that I think we're ignoring the real facts. No straight woman is as obsessed with pickleball as Jen is. <laughs> Might be some truth to that. I mean, here's the thing. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. The majority of the women in my pickleball group are lesbians. I really like lesbians a lot, as evidenced by who all sitting in this room with me. <laughs> so, I mean, he has a pretty valid I mean, point. Lesbians do run, should run the world. He has a pretty – I take it as a compliment. I do, too. No one can argue that you two – have your share of lesbian tendencies. No uh, question. Yeah. 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 We could find a lot. Yeah. She's been calling me a non practicing lesbian for 20 years. Yeah. For 20 years. Yeah. She's uh -huh. correct. This is not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a non practicing straight too. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Listener, here's the deal. You know, we started this tour and we called it the hot shit tour. Right. We didn't think we were hot shit. We were doing this whole thing, fake it till you make it. A hundred percent. Okay. Well, the faking is starting to pay off because we have a guest today. and It is a very huge get. Yeah. We're both freaking the fuck out. So nervous. Nervous about to shit our fucking <laughs> pants, listener. She is a fucking icon and she's only 34 years old. I know. Fearless. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with her. Obsessed. Beyond, I think I can't even comprehend what's about to happen. No. And I just think about us at 34 compared to her. Total fucking moron losers. Embarrassing. It's a comparison you cannot make or you'd start crying. A false equivalency. A false equivalency, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question about it. So nonetheless, this is happening. Yeah. And it's a big fucking deal. And we are going to be really good. So good. We're going to try not to cuss. We are going to be polite. We are going to make our points. We are going to be professionals. Yes. We are going to fucking crush it, Pumps. I want to so bad. You're going to. You're one of the biggest names in podcasting. <laughs> Shut up. You are so ridiculous. All right, listener. We need to welcome to I've Had It Podcast, hashtag pinch me, Congresswoman Alexandria ocasio Cortez. Pumps are friends at Happy Mammoth, you know, that make the hormone harmony that we're obsessed with. Love it. They now have the ultimate weight loss protocol 2.0. It's the new and improved version of Happy Mammoth's best-selling weight loss system. It's the world's first protocol that combines supplements, nutrition, and mindset to help women lose more weight faster without restrictive diets, calorie counting, or or exhausting workouts. The previous version has helped over 13,000 women, and this year's version is even better, faster, and more efficient. It's a three-month protocol where each month you take one or two formulas as instructed. The instructions are crystal clear and easy to follow. They won't take up more than 60 seconds of your entire day. Listener, all you have to do is go to happymammoth.com and you can get 15% off using our exclusive discount code, HADIT. The link is below in the show notes. Hey, Pumps, you know what's really starting to bother me? You know when you try to search for something on Netflix and it just shows you a bunch of related titles? Yes, it's so annoying. Well, here's the crazy thing, Pumps. If the show title appears in white at the top... That means Netflix actually has it on their platform in another country. And I've got a little hack that's going to blow your and our listeners' minds. You can trick Netflix into showing it to you with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that lets you change your online location so you can control where your Netflix and other related streaming services think you are located. So if you want to stay safe online and get access to a ton of great TV, we've got an incredible deal just for our listeners. When you sign up for ExpressVPN with our special link, you'll get three extra months free. Visit expressvpn.com slash had it. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash had it to get three extra months completely free.
All right, listener, let's welcome to I've Had It, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Welcome digitally to deep in a red state of (laughs) Oklahoma, a place you probably didn't think you would be today. I love it. I love it. It's wonderful to be here. We're so happy that you could join us. You know, we like to traffic in small ideas. (laughs) One could even call them petty. And we like to launch suggestions for our (laughs) listeners. We could argue that you traffic in big ideas. (laughs) And so if you could tell us, if you could join our team for a second, Mm -hmm. I know that there have got to be some petty things that get on your nerves. So what have you had it with? You know, I've had it with us pretending to all just get along with sports references in the workplace. <laughs> like people just, you know, men just lobbing out these sports references and everyone just, yeah, you know, acting like this is totally normal. And I propose that we should just start doing it back and saying, hey, you know what, Tom? I think we should just wait for the top coat to dry on this one. <laughs> And just start throwing things out like, and just let it sit there. Let it marinate. And walk away. Yeah. See if they that's, ever figure it out. That's what I think we should do. <laughs> I think that's a great, <laughs> great idea. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that'd be great. I would love that myself. Yes. Okay. So, you know, on our podcast, we've been a podcast for a little over a year and we have covered the um, nonsense and the grievances that happen when you travel in an airport. Mm. We've covered the problems that people face in the comment section on social media. We've gone to great links episode after episode to help the general public feel (laughs) somewhat normal for having these grievances. But an area we've been remiss have been workplace grievances. Mm. And I understand that you work for a rather large entity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I do, yes. you probably have quite a few co-workers. Yeah, it is like an airport in that way. <laughs> <laughs> and at this workplace, do any of your co-workers ever get on your nerves? Oh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. I think what's so interesting about my workplace, too, is that there's a real clash of cultures um, because everyone's flying in from all over the place, expecting everyone else to adhere to the norms of where they come from. And so no one is really adhering to anyone else's like social script. So for me as a New Yorker, it's maddening because I do not do well with passive aggression. Like, I like right. straight up aggression. <laughs> yeah. I want like real aggression. Like just tell me how it is. Right. Tell it to my face. Like give it to me straight. And there's a lot of like wild goose chases. There's a lot of, you know, people pretending that things are fine when they're not fine. Right. And I have to feel like a detective all the time. <laughs> uh, how do you really feel? <laughs> We've diagnosed this problem, and what we call this, these people are yak mouths. They Mm. just yak mouth, and they can't land the plane. And so we want to start a movement. Maybe you could talk to your colleagues about seeing what you all could do to help us on this. Fortunately, there is an emoji on the phone. If somebody is texting too long and not landing the plane, it's a plane landing emoji. But (laughs) maybe when you're at work, if somebody's yak mouthing too much, you can just do this. Just land the plane, <laughs> yeah. just the land the plane motion. We had um, years ago, some friends and I, we would have this this thing that we would do. It's very similar. When someone's taking too long to tell a story, we have our two hands that start off closed and they slowly <laughs> start expanding. And then if the person finally gets to the end, we go, best story ever. <laughs> best story this is- ever. This is when you know you're taking too long. <laughs> I love it. I want to get back to your coworkers. Mm-hmm. Do you ever deal with any workplace bullying at your job? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's an enormous amount. Here's, here's also, it kind of ties to the previous point, is that, you know, there's a lot of like, the bullying that happens externally, like people got a lot to say on the internet, 
and they have a lot to say when they go on Fox News and all of these things, but they just don't have the same energy in person. <laughs> and so it's it's so weird because they'll be waking up, having a morning coffee, seeing these folks being like, these communists and witches and all of these things. And then I'll see the same person like four hours later in a hearing. And it's like, oh, hey, Alex, how's it going? And I'm like, what <laughs> are you... Do you know that we see them? <laughs> it's unbelievable. I was listening to y'all's episode, actually, a recent one about Gigi Good, and you're talking about the inspirational quotes. Yes. Uh, and it's like, it, it's the same mentality where it's like you go to someone's, like someone will leave the most vile comments or DMs to you. And then you go to their Instagram page and it looks like, it looks like the home decor section of a Marshall's, like- <laughs> live laugh love like totally of, and it's like it's got like the cross emoji and the totally. like what is going on here right the <laughs> two of you i think it's this whole performative thing where people are masking something so we have identified mm -hmm. that if you see live laugh love if you see the cross emoji and a sunflower and a peace emoji you have to run. You have to run immediately. If you click on their profile and it's full of inspirational quotes, don't view those quotes as inspiration. View them <laughs> for the red flags that they are. And turn around and run for your life. It's unbelievable. We get a lot of haters online, which I don't know mm -hmm. if you do or not. <laughs> I've never heard of it. Like, I feel bad. For so we get some it. haters online and I'll click the profile in 10 times out of 10, it is this performative bullshit about what a great peace loving person they are. <laughs> Meanwhile, they traffic as trolls in the comment section, mad that pumps and me aren't big Trumpers because <laughs> by God, we're white and we're <laughs> Southern and we don't fit the script and they get really butthurt about it, Congresswoman. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe it, I believe it, but <laughs> Just, just know that type is an equal opportunity hater. Uh, they, they show up everywhere. They show up <laughs> everywhere. They're everywhere. I, but something that makes me feel a little bit better is every once in a while, I'll see like a totally benign account. It'll be like, you know, cute dogs on Instagram. And these people are hating on those pages too. They're like, <laughs> yes. what a mangy dog. And I'm like, nobody is no, safe. No <laughs> nobody is safe. Nobody is safe. It's unbelievable. We did. We had a post where Pumps shares that after she had uh, her child, she was constipated. It was terrible. It led to an unfortunate event where she tried to extract, you know what, with a spoon. Oh, no. It went viral on the internet. <laughs> and there were people actually in the comment section flexing about having regular bowel movements after their <laughs> pregnancies. Right. And I thought... This is where we are as a society. We are taking victory laps for having a good shit in the comment <laughs> section on social media. Comparison is the thief of joy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd like that comparison is the thief of joy. And do you ever experience at your place of employment any any coworkers that might try to sabotage the business? <laughs> oh, that's like part of the business. <laughs> The worst part is when, you know, you're trying to get something done and for some reason, it's like every time you're trying to do something, it's like sand is getting thrown into the gears and every single, st it's just like not going right. And you're trying to figure out like what is going on and you realize that someone's low key been trying to sabotage something without yeah. telling you. That I can imagine, you know, and I think that's something that people encounter in a lot of workplaces where you have like a secret hater. Yeah. And you're like, you don't realize it for the longest time. That happens all the time, all the time for, uh, for the strangest reasons too. Um, that's the, probably one of the most maddening things about it is that it's not just, you know, whether something moves or not is not always entirely based on policy. It's based on ego. It's based on feeling. And it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. 
Y'all, the egos that you have to deal with on a regular basis, I don't know how you do it and don't just start bitch slapping people. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's un, I'll watch some of that stuff and I'm just like, I don't know how someone hasn't strangled that man right now in front Mm -hmm. of everyone. I mean, how do you do that on a day in, day out? Do you just blow it off? I probably have less restraint (laughs) than some others. I'm not. When someone I think has really earned it, I am not afraid to embarrass someone in a public or semi-public environment, like especially when there's a gender dynamic involved Mm -hmm. or a racial dynamic, because we have to work so much harder. You know, we, we hear it all the time, having to work twice as hard to get half as far. And so that often means that People from different kinds of backgrounds, whether you come from a low income background or you weren't born with a silver spoon or, you know, whether you're a woman or a person of color, whatever it may be, where when you do get to that same place, a lot of times, you know, you'll see women running circles around the men and it's you get frustrated because people just aren't operating at the same level sometimes. Right. right. Um, And you know, I've had it with mediocrity <laughs> in the workplace, really. <laughs> totally. And you know what? I think we're celebrating mediocrity a bit too much, yeah. Congresswoman. Mm-hmm. On, yeah. Not just in workplaces, on the, the internet, and in the areas that we traffic in, there's a lot of celebrating of just having a baby or getting married. It seems like everybody's just celebrating a little bit overboard. But who would surprise our listeners the most out of all the skunks at the garden party that is your place of employment? Who would surprise us the most that is a, an ally of yours and not an ally ideologically, but somebody mm-hmm. with whom you enjoy and you like to work with? I'd say on the... I'll give one one example from from each party. Actually, okay. I'd say in the Democrats, um, uh, Jared Huffman of California is hilarious. <laughs> like this man is so funny and so witty. It's like you're sitting next to someone who just is knocking out one liners constantly. Um, has and I mean it's a super plus that he is wonderful on environmental and climate issues. He's a strong ally on LGBT and women's rights, all that. Um, But he's just, he is prolific in his one-liners. Very funny. Um, I'd say on the, on the Republican side, um, he, I, I were opposed on every single ideological issue possibly under the sun um, except he used to have a composting business. (laughs) Tim Burchett, uh, of Tennessee. Um, he's on the oversight committee. He's just a character, like a, a real character. Um, he's real strong on the UFO issue. And <laughs> he's like, he's like, listen, this is one thing we can work on here, you know? Um, and he's just a total character. He comes in in a Carhartt jacket every day. His glasses are on a rope around his neck. Um, it's great. It's, I mean, it definitely makes the, right. the, it's a very colorful personality to work with. Add some flavor. Well, yes. You know, where we live, uh, we're super progressive deep in this ruby red state and the optics of who you are here, mm-hmm. we understand because we're from here and we know the way people view a Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and we mm-hmm. understand the way they view a Senator Bernie Sanders. It's not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know know you're shocked. (laughs) But what it is, is you have, you become a caricature. Right. Of, of what people, you know, one statement you said or one belief, but I'm not a religious person, never have been. And I live deep in the buckle of the Bible belt. And what Mm -hmm. mystifies me, Congresswoman, is when I hear people that are, super religious, talk about the things that Jesus did, helping the poor, not judging, no violence. And then I look to the politicians that these people elect, and they take their Christmas card photos 
some of mm-hmm. your colleagues with AR-15s with their children. And then I listen to you and I listen to Senator Sanders and I hear a moral calling to help mm-hmm. poor people have access to health care, to help a marginalized group like maybe transgender children have the right to privacy and health care. And I don't hear that from these deep red politicians. I hear the contrary. So my question for you, Congress Roman, is do you think the Democratic Party and the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which I believe does have the moral high ground, do mm-hmm. you think there is a messaging problem now and historically with that wing of our political spectrum? Well, I think when it comes to the faith issue specifically, I think there's absolutely been a vacuum in terms of people being able to communicate in that medium. Um, I actually grew up in a around a lot of religious conservatism, and a lot of people would not know that, don't know that. Um, but I grew up with a very, you know, my my father's side of the family was Catholic. My mom's side of the family is much more evangelical, Pentecostal, oh, like wow. deep, 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 um, deeply religious and often uh, very adjacent to conservative religiosity, just culturally. And um, and in a lot of ways, like there's, you know, there's this thinking that everyone comes to this belief, comes to these this belief system or these conclusions because they like went to college and got radicalized by some Marxist professor. And right. now all the kids are going to hell in a handbasket because of it. But honestly, I feel like for me, a lot of the seeds of how I got to where I got to come from a moral place and they come from uh, a spiritual place. And in fact, When you look at some of the most successful movements in American history, like the civil rights movement, civil rights movement was a religious movement. Uh, Martin Luther King was a reverend and a pastor. And even if you look at more, you know, when you look at, 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 at those who are considered radicals in the movement, like Malcolm X, also very religious, um, as well. And so I do think that there is a, there's a missing component where a lot of times what's being messaged is in a logical way or in a wonkish way. And uh, and people are kind of like focused on the policy and this, that, and the other. And the flip on the flip side of that, while some of us can be very demonized, like Bernie or myself, I actually think one of the reasons why we've been successful is because we try to message on that moral plane as well. And because it starts gaining so much traction, these folks with like Fox News and et cetera, they realize that they need to create a caricature in order to stop the momentum of that train. Because when you actually start talking about, hey, you know, it's really messed up to think someone that has has to earn health care, like right. earn the right to be seen by a doctor, that you have to be, you know, make a certain income or you have to be a person that's deemed worthy to get medicine. People really realize how backwards that is. And that, you know, even if you do come to this from a religious background, it's we are not the judge and jury. If you are, you know, if you're a religious person, that's that happens upstairs. That's not our job. Right. My thinking is, having grown up deep in the Bible Belt, that the religion should set the psychological soil for you to be more of an advocate for those that are marginalized and less judgmental for those that are marginalized. And specifically in our state, they started fighting the culture wars and Mm -hmm. they're winning. And we have a friend who has a transgender daughter in our state. And I called her yesterday and I told her that you were going to be on. And I said, what is it like for you raising a transgender child in this atmosphere? And it's anguish for Mm -hmm. her because now not only being a kid is hard, being a transgender kid is even harder. And you have kids that make fun of you or what have you that all, we all experience, but seems to be exacerbated if you are trans. 
And now you have your own government that is institutionalizing this systemic bigotry towards you. And she went to the Oklahoma state capitol and spoke to a congressman and said, if my daughter is brave enough to tell me who she is Mm -hmm. and how she feels, then we should be brave enough to acknowledge her and love her back. And he looked at my friend in the face and he said to her, you should be brave enough to make your kid be a better child. Oh, my God. Isn't that awful? And so she said to me, these people aren't going to change their minds. So in states like ours, your voice, you might not believe it, but there are pockets, and I know you know this, there are pockets of people that our own governments seem to be a little bit trafficking a little bit more cruelty than we like. Mm -hmm. And we look to people like you from deep in red states and a Bernie to say, okay, we're all at least a part of this country. But for the trans children that live in these red states that just want love and acceptance, I asked my friend, I said, what are you going to do? She said, I think sometimes our only option is to move. It's just, you know, it's horrible that this is their goal, right? A lot of times I think a lot of these folks just, they have no sense of deep understanding of what it is that they're doing. They, I, I, there are, there's an extent where they truly drunk the Kool-Aid on this and it's, um, it's like the brainwashed then gain power. Right. And when it comes to this trans issue, um, one of the things that I think is really important is to express like how, how imperiling trans kids hurts all kids. And for me, exposing the absurdity of all this, where it's like, oh, you want to, you want to expose all these trans kids, quote unquote, all when really it's less than 1% of the population. Right. Um, How are you going to do that? And a lot of these places seriously are proposing genital checks on yes, I know. They're proposing genetic screenings. They're proposing in Florida, girls have to report when they're getting their period. And so really the trans issue a lot of times is a smoke screen for the abortion issue. Mm-hmm. Because if they can start tracking your period and getting menstrual data about you um, from the time that you are, you know, when you first, from the time that you first enter puberty, then the state can start storing that data and really start more meticulously trying to track who may be getting an abortion, who isn't, you know, and, and this is why it's so important for us to be standing together in solidarity. Trans rights are women's rights. That's right. Mm-hmm. And if you believe in women's rights, then we have an obligation to stand with our trans sisters and brothers and siblings, um, because the moment you start making little carve outs for your values, the whole thing starts turning to Swiss cheese and falling apart. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's something we feel very passionate about as mothers to mm-hmm. stand up and support these families and let our allyship shine through. And I think it's a very important conversation to have and have in kind, rational terms like we just had wrapped in love mm-hmm. and reason. But I have to talk to you about something that we feel like we've been fighting. OK, and I want to see if maybe mm-hmm. you and your colleagues could help us with this. It's a little pet sure. project of ours. <laughs> We've been sounding the alarm, Congresswoman, and it's these gender reveal parties. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I don't know if you and your friends at work can help us with this, if we're just going to be over here on Asshole Island, whistleblowing (laughs) by ourselves. People are dying. Now there's a new thing. One lady is suffering from gender disappointment. Right. Because her child wasn't the gender she wanted to be. And she put it on the internet forever. Suffering. Yeah. yeah. She wants to have a new I mean, medical diagnosis. She's really going to be th- going oh for a goodness. loop if her child ends up being trans. Well, right. She could well, she should twice. celebrate. <laughs> well, here's the, here's the one, here's the thing about it that I just can't get over is when they do the gender reveal party and it's a girl and the father is clearly disappointed. Yeah. yeah. And 
they post the video anyway. Right. Like, I thought that yes. Was Why would you post Why it? would you do that? <laughs> Okay, we have to play our game, Had It or Hit It with you. Okay, great. Oh my God. Welcome to Had It or Hit It. I would hit it. Had it. Had it. I hit it every day, sometimes twice a day. Had it or hit it, couples photo shoots. I've had it. Um, I've had it. I've had it. No. <laughs> or, you know, if you do it, you can keep that to yourself, but the... I think also sometimes the random ones too, like if you're just dating and, and then it's like, did something happen? Right. <laughs> Are you engaged? What's going on? Is there on? a pregnancy engagement? <laughs> and it's like, no, we're just hanging out. I don't want to yuck anyone's yum, but not for me. Yeah. Not for me. We're in complete agreement. Okay. Had it or hit it. Shirts and or clothing with words. I I think I've had it with that. Um, unless, unless it's a it, tax the rich dress at the Met Gala. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. If it's done well, if right. it's done well, right. it's good execution. Right. Um, but you know, I don't know, you know, cause we're also in a little bit of like a nineties, early two thousands revival. Yes. So it, yeah. I, I could, it could be coming back and I'm just like behind the, the thing on it. But I think. I think if it's done well, if it's done creatively, yes. If it's just like aerial font and you're just phoning it in, right. then maybe not. I think it's corny at that point. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Had it or hit it, kitten heels. I've never been a fan of the kitten heel myself. I'm also like, I'm 5'4", so what's the point, right? Like if I'm going to wear a heel, it's to have a heel. But um, I mean, we see DeSantis, like he's clearly rejected the kitten heel. He's going for blonde <laughs> stiletto. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's what they say. <laughs> stiletto heel. Okay. Had it or hit it, pickleball? Mm, I don't think pickleball's for me. And it's, but, but. I don't know. This is a hard one because it's, I know it's all the rage right now. I think we're getting close to the expiration on pickleball potentially. I don't know. Congresswoman, I, I am, I have won a gold so medal happy. in pickleball. <laughs> I'm a medalist. <laughs> My listeners are so tired of hearing about it. Okay. But I don't know, but you know, I, a friend of mine had a pickleball party and everybody really enjoyed themselves. It's a way to be athletic without yes. Being athletic, you know, you're not freaking <laughs> gifted. So I think there's a space for that. I think that I haven't, I'll, I'll hit it. I'm not going to be a hater. I'm going to, I'll say we'll hit it. She okay. acts like it's Wimbledon every day. And so it drives me crazy. It's Wimbledon to me. Okay. Had it or hit it, tip flation. Oh, I've had it. Had it. I've had as, as a former service worker, yeah. as you know, I worked years in restaurants. I worked off of tips only as a tipped weight. I was cleaning out my apartment and I found like old checks from when I worked in restaurants and it's, you know, zero, you get paid right. nothing. Right. Tip worker. It's real, but the tipflation on everything, if you're making a standard wage, if you were making a wage before, and now all of a sudden like tips on everything, I think it, it hurts actual tipped workers because people are tipping on everything and they don't know like what's a tip who's getting who's making a tip right. wage who's not like this is an actual distinction right if you're a tipped wage worker in a lot of states you're making two dollars an hour that's right but if you're a non-tipped wage worker and you have like a tip screen on it then you know what's happening is that those tipped wage workers oftentimes like i've heard from a lot of folks and a lot of my friends in hospitality that tips have been going down yeah. because people yes. are like don't know what's what it is anymore. And I just don't, I, we can't have a tip screen on every single thing, especially if I serve myself, like, exactly. Yes. I think I'm at the airport. I grab this orange juice. Like, right. what's my <laughs> and it's, con for? it's consumer exploitation by these big corporations that don't want to pay their workers a livable wage. And like you said, we waited tables in college as well. It hurts those that really rely on those tips. Okay. Mm -hmm. Had it or hit it, Joe Biden. 
Hit it. You know, honestly, here's the thing. I think sometimes people want electoral politics to be, we overly identify with, it's like, if you vote for someone, they have to be the embodiment of you. And that's actually something that I think Donald Trump provided to a lot of people, where it's like, if you voted for him, and if you were a Donald Trump person, like you, you want, like it, it symbolized so much, but I think what we have here in this situation is a more just honest thing. There are plenty of things that the president does that I completely disagree with. Um, I think, you know, right now what's happening in Gaza, I can't, I, I just, I, I can't go on every single day seeing this. I don't associate myself with what's happening, but at the end of the day, um, we have to acknowledge that we we just can't allow this fascist movement to grow in this country. And what I think is actually hopeful about our politics is that we can exist outside of electoral politics in organizing our communities and standing with our friends. And, you know, if it's coming down to this next election, for me, Personally, the decision to vote is not a difficult one for me um, because like just because I'm voting for him doesn't mean that he embodies everything about me. Right. Um, So that to me is where I'm at. Um, But I think, you know, it's people are going to get mad on the Internet because that's what they do. But I think we just got to be adults about the situation and realize like that electoral politics is just one, it's just one small sliver of how we make the world better. And if we put all of our eggs into that basket, people start acting way too crazy. And like Donald Trump is what you actually get. (laughs) (laughs) Donald Trump is what you actually get when you want a politician to embody all of like your hopes and dreams and like caricatures of yourself. And Donald Trump, affirms insecure men's idea of masculinity. Yes. They affirm insecure people's idea of wealth. Internalized misogyny. Yeah. In Mm -hmm. insecure white folks idea of race. Like that's what you get when you want your everything to come, all of your like life and identity affirming things to come from electoral politics. You get demagogues. Right. People who want to like symbolize these psychological things. Joe Biden doesn't do that. And uh, I think that's actually a good thing. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Because like, you know, in the, it's it's more honest, I think, about where we are, whether we like it or not. He's our grandpa <laughs> mm-hmm. that saved what us from our, from our alcoholic stepfather that abused, <laughs> abused us for four years. <laughs> One just quick follow up question as a voter in deep in a red state and a a lifelong Democrat, does the Democratic Party, because we got so dicked over by Mm -hmm. um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, does the Democratic Party have a backup plan between now and November should Joe Biden fall prey to some sort of medical emergency that you're aware of? And I think as a voter, it's a very reasonable question to ask considering his advanced age. I think it's a super reasonable question to ask. Um, you know, I'm not, I do not know, to be honest. Um, I think what people tend to look at is just line of succession in terms of the job itself. Uh, but, you know, it is something that I think is, is a reasonable question to ask. Um, and there are, you know, you have people that are kind of running, but haven't qualified for these seats. I think it's important to know that uh, if if something like that does or were to happen because there is not a primary, I do believe it would go to the convention. And that is a big gobbledygook situation. Um, so we'd have to honestly see, but I think it's a perfectly valid question to ask. And uh, I think it's, it's also one that, you know, I think there's... This is the biggest disconnect, I'd say, between the Beltway and like everyday people. 
Um, but it also cuts this question of, I think a lot of people think who can beat Trump. Um, and that's a largely untested assumption too. There's a lot of like this idea that, you know, only another white guy can beat Trump. Right. Um, and there's a lot of kind of assumptions there that obviously don't feel good. Um, but yeah, you know, that's it. It's, it's a valid question to ask and I do not have an answer for you. Maybe you could check around with your coworkers <laughs> and circle back to us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's going to happen. Okay. Congresswoman Pumps, we did it. We did we it. We kept ourselves together. This has been I can such talk. a treat. I'm freaking the fuck out. This was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you do and for being such an amazing guest. Your voice matters far beyond your district. There are people just like us peppered all through all of these red states that are progressive, and they are the allies that stand with trans kids and the LGBTQIA plus community and the black and brown communities as strong as we can. So thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for being on our little podcast. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. We did it. High five. Oh High five to you more than me. I got so tongue tied, I couldn't even talk. So you had to carry me. I knew the question you were supposed, supposed to, to ask, ask, and I didn't and you ask never it. Did I couldn't. It. And I could, I, I could. I was so starstruck. I could sense your paralysis. That's I was how paralyzed. close we are because we're twin flames. We're twin flames. <laughs> <laughs> yes. me, me, the divine feminine. You, the yeah, divine so masculine. Yes. So thank you for bailing me out and taking over because <laughs> I was just like so starstruck. I could barely see straight. Listener. We just had our EOC on the podcast. Oh my God, that she's amazing. She's amazing. I love her. I love her. I would like to dedicate this episode to the motherfucker in the comment section that accused us yep. of being centrist. <laughs> Take this episode and cram it right up your fucking ass. <laughs> Please give us five stars. Send a voice memo to our Instagram page. Check us out at the Hot Shit Tour. No centrists invited. Um, documentary Club on Patreon. Join us on Patreon. It's not only do the Documentary Club. We drop full episodes from time to time that are only Patreon exclusive. Pumps, tell them. We will see you next Tuesday or Thursday or both. Bye.